Hey everybody, Dr. G here. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and body language expert. And today we're going to be analyzing Chad and Lori Daybell. Chad and Lori Daybell are believed to be involved in the murders of several people, including Chad Daybell's ex-wife, Lori Daybell's ex-husband, and Lori Daybell's two children. It's a big, complicated case, but today we're going to break down their body language before the trial starts. We're going to see if we can get a baseline of what their body language is like, and we're going to see if we can get a better understanding of what they do when they lie, so we'll know it when we see it. On top of that, I'm going to be covering the trial a lot. So this won't be my only video on them, but this will give us a good background of their body language. I'm also going to be exploring their mindsets, because if you can better understand Chad, you can better understand Lori. Last thing, don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to see more content like this as it comes out. All right, let's get started. So what you're seeing right here is a Zoom hearing from a couple of years ago. And as you can tell, Chad Daybell and the red tie and the white shirt is remarkably still. Now, I've talked about this in other videos, Brian Koberger being one, Aiden Fucci being another. I've talked about how psychopaths can be very still, stare people down. One thing that's interesting about Chad Daybell is this is more intentional on his part, and I'll, I'll show you why as we watch other videos of him. This is not him stuck in fight or flight, because I've talked about when people are in fight or flight, they freeze. Usually that only lasts a couple of minutes. He does this in different videos for literally hours. I believe that this is him trying to maintain control. And as we talk about that, we'll get into his psychology. Basically, I believe that this is a practiced behavior on his part that he knows how to sit and not move. You will literally only see his eyes move. I'm gonna just skip ahead a little bit so you can see some of this. Look, I mean, we're going over a couple of minutes. Oh wait, we actually saw a little bit of movement there. He moved his head. I mean, that's about as much as you get out of him during this entire hearing. It doesn't matter where we skip into this. This is intentional. This is a way for him to feel powerful and in control. And just to be super clear, I don't think he believes a single word that he told Lori or anybody else. I don't think he believes in zombies. I don't think he believes that the world is ending. I don't think he believes he had near-death experiences. I think that he is a con man and he knows it. I don't think that he is detached from reality. These are all lies that he tells to control other people. And as you can see, his body language right now is very, very controlled. But one thing that narcissists and psychopaths like to do is to be in control. And so he's in a situation now where other people have legitimate control over him, such as the judge, the attorney that represents him, the prosecuting attorney. There are people in this room that have actual control over him, and he does not like it. And so he is giving them nothing. So here's an interview with Chad Daybell about the books that he's authored. That all came from, what was your motivation originally to start writing? Okay, I started as a reporter and editor at the Standard Examiner after I'd graduated from BYU in journalism where I'd served as the city editor. So as you can hear, he's calm. He has a, a calm way of talking, but he's not flat like he was in the last video that he watched. He has the ability to display motion and engage and come off as normal for lack of a better term. And while I was in Ogden, I kept getting ideas to write a novel, but when you're an editor eight hours a day, you kind of get burned out and hung about two feet above the door. And I, kn I knew it was Eddie, it just had to be. And I kind of told him, it's time to go to the light, Eddie. And um, he gave one last ditch effort, I guess. So what we're now seeing is he's marking himself as special. He's saying, look, I've got this ability to interact with people. I'm telling a spirit to go to the light. So he's now starting to show that he believes that he is special. And this is important because narcissists truly believe they are special. That is one of their primary traits. They believe they are special. They are grandiose. They have to be different than everybody else and more important. The next morning I found the garbage can shoved in front of my door. Um, the locks were all opened again. Now, what did you end up doing? Okay, I worked for C. Now here's something that's important from his body language. You'll see him doing this. Okay, we call this steepling. This oftentimes is a way that we try to come across as experts to people. It's kind of pretentious. I don't particularly like, like it a whole lot, and I think that it's a bad idea for most people to do. But some people don't do it consciously. But the fact that he's holding it low 
probably means that he is not feeling as confident as he wants to. He wants to come across as an expert. He wants to come across as convincing. We've actually got research that shows that doing this in court makes expert witnesses more believable. And that's true. But the fact that he does it low probably means that he's not fully confident in what he's saying, but he's desperate to be. And you're going to see him go between this and sometimes this, which also shows a lack of confidence. During this interview, he talks about a woman who claimed to have near-death experiences that led to them publishing her book. Narcissists are oftentimes jealous. You're going to notice some remarkable similarities between the things that she talked about, or that he says that she talked about, and then what he later on experienced. Let's listen to some of this. She had had a near-death experience in 1999, and she met one of our authors at a book signing. Now, as a newspaper editor, you knew how to do that. You knew how to yes. interview somebody to really come at them from a couple different angles exactly. and see if they were, like you say, exaggerating or mm -hmm. flowering up. Now, right now, he's showing a lot of what appears to be genuine emotion. I think it's very possible that he actually does believe that she had a near-death experience that led her to experience the things he talks about. But once again, I think that led him to feeling greatly jealous of having those experiences because he ends up claiming to have similar experiences in order to gain power in his own life. The story, so to speak. Because I have read a lot of books about near-death experiences and also... Uh, doctrinally, I wanted to make sure she was on track. She says, I didn't really tell everything because it kind of scares me, but I went to, the, the Savior showed me a window that showed future events. cross-examined her enough, I felt confident about it, and that's when we put together first her book called... I've talked about before head nods and shakes and things like that and how they can reinforce what we're, what we're saying and believing. You could watch that when he's talking about this, he is nodding his head. I really so think this that is he seven does. seven years later, and after I had cross-examined her enough, I felt confident about it, and that's when we put together... I think he really did feel confident that she had experienced what she claimed. Their first, her book called Led by the Hand of Christ, which is more... Now, one thing you'll notice about Chad's body language right here is he's leaning forward towards the interviewer. He likes this interviewer. Obviously, the interviewer seems to be entertaining the things that he's talking about. It's an amazing story that and, uh, really inspired me. It follows along. I mentioned earlier how his fingers were going to be interlocked, and this is an example of that. They're pretty tightly interlocked, too, which to me says that he's experiencing some level of stress in this situation, some level of discomfort with some of the things they're talking about. Really closely with, like, LDS church doctrine and that kind Absolutely. of... Absolutely. She's a very faithful LDS woman. In that... Uh, so what we've seen here during this interview is someone who's fairly low-key, kind of awkward, not super comfortable, wanting to come across as comfortable, wanting to be authoritative, wanting to be someone who's powerful. And what we're also seeing is the genesis of where his lies came from. He used directly the experiences of someone whose book he had published. He ended up taking those for himself because, once again, narcissistic people get incredibly jealous. And if there's part of him that believed that what she experienced was real... He had to say he experienced it too because that would make him powerful. Here's Chad Daybell again after some time has passed. He's going to be listening to a secret phone recording that someone recorded after the kids were missing. But as you'll see, the contrast between his interview from 2011 and how he acted more recently, here he is sitting still again, sitting and not moving. Just take a watch. I just needed to use, have somebody that I, so I wouldn't have to tell them where he really was because they were going to tell Kay where he is. Oh, uh, yeah. So is it, do you think it's like your family or, you know, like your family, your dad or, you know, those well, my people? Family, well, not my whole family, but you, as you know. Even writing, if you notice, I mean, he moves very little even when trying to write. I mean, just watch this again. Oh, uh, yeah. So is it, do you think it's like your family or, you know, like your family, your dad or... As you can see, he didn't even move his left hand. He moved his right hand over, wrote a little bit, put his hands back together. He's trying to maintain as much control as possible. As you know, most of my family is working against me and yeah. with her, basically. Yeah. Is JJ safe? He is safe and happy. Okay, well, that's good to hear. He even looked at the camera before he moved at all. It's like he wants to make sure he knows and is thinking about everything that's watching him. Watch this, watch this glance. Yeah. Is JJ safe? 
and then he's willing to do a tiny movement. And happy. Now he's taking in deep breaths, which means his heart's pumping harder, which means he does feel something here. There's psychopaths that we've looked at that I genuinely think are feeling next to nothing or very little. I think he's feeling quite a lot and he's suppressing it. Watch him as you watch his chest as he breathes. He is breathing fairly deeply. I'm to share with you if you don't mind. I love it. I was thinking about some of the things you guys have gone through, and I saw the scripture today, and I wanted to I want you to comment. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question yeah. about scripture. Okay. okay. So. So you ask, why would somebody like this have people around him killed, or even do it himself? And it's because of narcissistic rage and pure jealousy. I believe, based on everything we're talking about, it's very likely that he was extremely jealous of other people. Narcissists often are. Now let's take a minute and look at Lori Daybell's body language. It is drastically different than his, and it'll give us a better understanding of the interplay between the two. So now we're going to watch some of Lori Vallow Daybell and get an idea of what her baseline behavior is like in court. Let's just watch. Here, represented by her attorneys Jim Archibald and John Thomas, uh, in terms of these motions. As you can already see, she's smirking throughout this. She looks fairly comfortable. She's showing a lot more body language than Chad Daybill did. She's not having any problems showing facial expressions. She's paying attention to what people are saying. She seems to be comprehending what they're saying just fine. Clarify for the court. I think that at this point, she may feel like she is going to get through this with no problem. Like when they talk about whether or not she's ready, she just seems to smile and nod. There seems to be a certain level of arrogance. Act, uh, to further that agreement, whether that overt act. Now, this was interesting. Just now, mm, you see her chew the inside of her mouth. That's the first thing we've seen that really showed anxiety today. Let's go back and look at what they were talking about. There are three agreements. The, the conspiracy, the crime of the conspiracy is the agreement and an overt act uh, to further that agreement, whether that overt act is otherwise illegal or not. So talking about the conspiracy, there's maybe a, a, an ounce of weakness that she feels about this. Once they start phrasing it in this way, I think that that might make her start to feel a little uncomfortable. So she goes back and forth between feeling superior, feeling a bit smug, and then maybe they're making her get a little bit anxious about this. It doesn't have to be. Only a 14 year maximum, one is up to life in prison or death. Uh, do you pick the higher one? Do you pick the lower one? Does it matter? Do you pick both? Could they run consecutive? So here you see a laugh, and this is a genuine laugh. You can see the wrinkles next to her eyes. You can see the smile. This is some. She is genuinely amused right now at the idea that they're talking about how they'll sentence her. Let's go back just so you can watch that happen again. Maximum penalties for that offense where you've got one offense that's only a 14-year maximum. One is up to life in prison or death. Uh, do you pick the higher one? Do you pick the lower one? Does it matter? Do you pick both? Could they run consecutive? Based on all available information, it may be that she feels like she's above this and it doesn't really matter what they say her sentence is. She may feel like she's going to rise above it or beat it or that they, can, they ultimately can't get to her. I think there's moments where she feels a little bit of anxiety, but when they talk about this, there's something about it that genuinely seems to feel ridiculous to her. The problem with someone like Lori Daybell, as we'll see, is that she's a combination, very likely, of a narcissist and someone with delusions. Whereas Chad Daybell seems to be more of a narcissist and a psychopath. He seems to be a bit more of the cult leader, Jim Jones type, but maybe with, without the charisma. Lori Daybell seems to be someone who's a narcissist and also is delusional. And so when you combine these two, these are the kinds of situations that can arise from that. They just, they're, there's a synergy between them and has created a horrible situation for anybody in their orbit. And on top of that, they've been going after people's money. So there's definitely some willfulness to this. This isn't all based on these weird beliefs. All right, I'll stop talking. Let's keep going. Um, those are questions I have. Court under seal. You don't have any. Now you'll see her chin is raised up high. That's when people genuinely believe they're better than the people they're talking to. You know, you hear the, idea, the, the phrase of somebody turning their nose up to someone. That's what the body language shows, is that when we do that, that is our way of showing our superiority. She believes she is above this court. She believes she is above the people around her. She believes she is above the judge, I imagine, based on the fact that he was just talking, and this is the body language we're seeing. So now Lori Daybell is going to get interviewed by police about the death of Charles Vallow. We're going to watch her talk a little bit just to get a baseline of what she's like during this. He hasn't been here in a couple weeks since we moved in. Okay. He came 
he was very nasty when he was there, and, but he travels for business. So he went back to the Houston house, okay. and he's like, I'm coming on Wednesday night, and I'm going to come pick up JJ and take him to school Thursday. Pick him up Thursday, take him Friday, whatever. So as you can see, she's very engaging. She speaks very fluidly. She doesn't seem to have any problems talking about these kinds of things. And I said, Casey wanted to come to the house. And I said, you can't come stay at this house because you can't get along with Tylee. She's a minor. She has to live here. Yeah. So you, Casey gets in huge fights up there. Okay. And she hates him. <laughs> and so I'm like, you can't stay at the house. So I will book you a hotel because he stays in hotels all the time because he travels for business. Mm -hmm. And the so this is part that you can tell is true. He does probably stay at hotels for business, things like that. She's talking about things in a way that she seems confident in. There, there seems to be no sign of deception as she says that. Business pays for it, right? Uh -huh. So I said, I will book you a hotel nearby. What does he do? And I imagine most people that are watching this already know this, but she does seem remarkably calm considering her husband died very recently. He has like books of business in different okay. areas. And so he just goes wherever. Okay. It kind of just gives him freedom that he doesn't have to stay home every day and take care of special needs. Yeah. It's like an excuse. <laughs> See, and this is her trying to connect with somebody else, saying, well, he doesn't have to stay home and take care of a special needs child. Trying to relate to the interviewer. She's trying to charm her because she wants to keep her from pressing her too hard. <laughs> so I've done that myself for the last seven years now. I'm like grappling around or whatever. And then... Um, I mean, that was all and he, quickly. And he. So one thing, I, I, I do kind of wish that the investigator hadn't started talking again and just let her sit there because it can be very powerful to let somebody sit until they feel like they are going to naturally stop talking. Because when she is, she's so fluid with the way that she talks. So when we see her stutter a little bit, I wish she would have let her do that more because we don't really know where that would go. That's going to help you get more lies out of somebody is if they are lying or they're starting on one, make them talk more because that will make them be more likely to trip up on their lies. Or on the other side to try to just get out of his range where he kind of hit me. And then now you'll notice as she's talking about this part, her left arm is sitting still. She's somebody that talks with her hands a lot. And so it's noticeable to me that her left arm is not moving right now. Because she, historically, she really does talk with both of her hands. And I would imagine that she knows that this is a weak part of her story. So oftentimes when people talk with both of their hands, we see them as being more honest. But it doesn't mean that people don't do it when they lie. But I think that she knows that this is a weak part of her story. So she's keeping her left arm a little bit more still. Right. And so... Then he got up and he had the bat like this towards me and I was going around the other side to try to just get out of his range where he kind of hit me and then were saying or yelling during all of this if they were at all. Just kind of get off me, ow, or whatever, you know, whatever. They were like, like, don't talk to my niece that way. You also hear us use lots of kind of and like suggest that it's a flexible answer. In other words, if you say, well, it's kind of like this, that's not saying it is this. It means it's maybe like that. Let's listen to her say that again. Remember what your, your husband or your brother were saying or yelling during all of this? If they were at all? Just kind of get off me, ow, or what, you know, whatever. They right, so that's a non-committal answer. Just kind of get off of me, ow, that kind of thing. They were like... Like, don't talk to my niece that way. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Like, it was, I don't remember specifics, but they were kind of both. They were kind of in the heat of it. I don't think there was much, many words, many words. that I remember. Mm -hmm. so, so she just contradicted herself. This is kind of what she said, and then there weren't many words. And this is the kind of stuff that we can hone in on. And he goes outside. Yeah, she was outside. And, and then what happened? Then he... Okay. Yeah. He, had, he was a base, professional baseball player. Okay. <laughs> so it wasn't a good idea for Tyler to get out of that. <laughs> See, so now she's providing details in a way to connect. And you'll see that her body language gets a lot more calm when she feels like she's able to connect with somebody, when she's able to feel like, okay, now I've given them a detail, and it's something that's not related to me talking about what happened, that he's a professional baseball player. See, she gets, she does appear a lot more comfortable and smiling when talking about this. Probably not the... I mean, he played semi-pro. Yeah. I around mm -hmm. to the kitchen to get away from him, and so back around... So so that whole going around thing, that was a detail that's very important to her. It seems less important to the interviewer. But she has mentioned that many times because I think as she played in her head how she was going to explain this, that was going to be something important. I don't know if that's 
that, that would make it so she couldn't see. I, I don't really understand that detail myself, but that's very important to her because she keeps repeating it, and that's an important part of her lie. So, I don't know if you went in the house. I didn't, so I'm like so, a little bit of a disadvantage. Yeah, so I went inside and I didn't. Okay. I didn't know what to do, and Tyler was freaking out. And you'll see how low her hands are right now. Once again, this, her, her keeping hands low, we saw Chad Daybell doing that also. Sometimes when people are losing confidence, their hands get lower. And so that may be what we're seeing, is that she's feeling less confident about how she's pulling this off. Responsible is usually a good thing. Right, but I'm responsible with uh, And then, do you remember if uh, at any time... So you so you see the hands gripping the biceps. This is something that we also see that we associate more with stress. If she was comfortably laying with her arms crossed, sometimes that can mean people are being defensive, but generally that's just a sign of comfort. Not always, but, but oftentimes. The gripping of the bicep, the bicep is specifically associated with tension. Now we're gonna watch another minute of Lori Daybell in court. This was back in 2020. So as you can see, from the video that we watched first of her, which was very recent, to the video here, which was a few years ago, it's the same presentation, the same smiling, the same sort of charming, trying to, to get along with people, smiling at her lawyers, looking at people. It's a very similar presentation. Not much seems to have changed. So now the trial is set to begin very soon, and I'll be watching closely. Hopefully you've gotten a better understanding today of the way that she acts when she's uncomfortable and the amount of arrogance that she has when she's in court. So I think we're going to see her be very confident at times. And then I think there's going to be things that will make her very uncomfortable. And she has some tells. She'll still seem friendly. She'll still seem open. But there will be small, subtle things that she will do that I think will let us in on what the reality is. That being said, I do think she has some very strange beliefs. It does seem, based on all available information, that she actually does believe that her kids were not themselves or whatever it is that Chad Daybell had come up with. But I don't believe for a second that Chad Daybell believes a word he said. And so I think that she tends to be more of a narcissist that is also stuck with delusion and that he is more of a narcissist that is more capable of being a psychopath. And together they were extremely, extremely dangerous. But I do think that both of them knew that what they were doing was absolutely wrong. So stay tuned. I got more coming. As I talked about last time, in the description below, I have a wait list. If you're interested in learning a course on body language, I am going to be creating one over the next little while. So if you think you want to do something like that, please join me there. Uh, last thing I want to say is just to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more of this content. Thanks so much for watching.